Good morning, good evening, whatever time you're listening. This is Christopher Moonlight for the Practical Effects Podcast, part of LegolasCorpse.com and the Crypt Network. Uh, today we are joined by uh, Matt Winston of the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. Unfortunately, we are lacking uh, my co-host, Jack Ritchie, who is part of uh, darkestjack.com, but uh, we're going to move on without him, and uh, next time we'll, we'll have him back in. He's going to film school right now, so we can't begrudge him that. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, Matt Winston, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me on, Christopher. Jack is missed, but I think you and I will have a good conversation anyway. And of course, anything related to practical effects is uh, something that I love, so thanks for having me on the podcast. Well, I'm ver- very happy to have you. So, usually we start with uh, current events uh and just talk a little bit about what's going on in movies how we feel about it and uh i think that uh before we started uh you mentioned that one of the current events that you're thinking about is just how the franchises that uh, your father stan winston was originally involved in still endure today and uh, are going strong we have jurassic world on its way and terminator Genesis, uh, as well as a rumored Alien 5. Uh, how do you feel about these things? Well, I think it's kind of remarkable that those three franchises you mentioned uh, continue. And obviously there were a lot of creators involved in all three of those. You know, of course, the vision of James Cameron that launched the Terminator franchise, Michael Crichton's terrific book that launched Jurassic Park, and uh, the Ridley Scott, uh, H.R. Giger collaboration, Alien. So, you know, Dad can't take full credit for these continuing to move on, but he certainly did play a, a huge role in, in uh, especially the genesis of Jurassic Park and Terminator. I think it's really a testament to the fact that those films featured a compelling story and uh, were told with the greatest characters ever put on film, and they continue to resonate with audiences. And I I think it's just, Dad would love to see that they continue. Um, And I don't know. uh, It's just exciting to see that he's still here as each of these new films roll out. He stands still here, you know. That that certainly is, uh, you know, the, the idea that artists live on through their work, and definitely uh, Predator... Terminator, Aliens, these characters are now just as iconic as Bela Lugosi's Dracula, the Wolfman, the Mummy. Uh, they are kind of become like the new universal monster lineup. And uh, not to mention, uh, aren't, isn't there talk of rebooting Pumpkinhead as well? Oh, yeah, let's not forget Pumpkinhead. I think Pumpkinhead's actually had more sequels than all the others combined. (laughs) They just haven't haven't been as uh, out in the public view. But, yeah, Pumpkinhead is is being revived now. That's what I hear. I think that's great. I I would like to see it uh, get another chance. I I did not see Pumpkinhead 2, but I saw part of Pumpkinhead 3, and I can only recall from Lance Henriksen's book that uh, he, he was not happy to be a part of those and didn't feel that they lived up to the original movie that he was a part of and, and felt was a, a really strong movie that he was proud to be a part of. Well, I can't uh, speak to that because I haven't seen any of the sequels, Christopher. I've only seen my dad's original, so I, I will withhold comment. I think that's for the best, um, both politically correct and probably just wise for how you spend your time. Yes. Uh, so anyway, well, I'm really excited to see uh, where these franchises go. I'm, of course, a little, you know, um, what's the word? I'm, I'm also apprehensive because I have such a deep love for the original content. I think Aliens was a movie that uh, changed my life in terms of watching it and saying, this is something that I need to be a part of. And then I'll never forget seeing 
Terminator 2 and sitting in the theater and just being so awestruck by what the T-1000 was. And that wasn't just CGI. That was uh, Stan Winston Studios, now Legacy FX. And, uh, you know, I just remember sitting there thinking to myself, how in the hell are they going to beat this thing? Because if this thing was after me, I'd be done. This, I, I couldn't figure out how they were going to do it, and I thought it was handled so brilliantly. So the, the amount of brilliance that these new movies have to live up to is uh, it's a pretty high bar to reach, and I don't think any amount of technology uh, is going to... Um, bring them any further in, in meeting that bar. It's in, like you said, how the story comes across. Yes, I, I agree with you. Um, number one, I share your apprehension generally for sequels. I think that most often a sequel is greenlit because the bankers who run the studio are uh, aware that there's a built-in audience and their risk is mitigated and it seems like a good investment so that's typically what drives sequels. Um, occasionally, a filmmaker like James Cameron will match uh, the original, as I believe he did with Aliens. Obviously, it, was a, it wasn't a horror film. It was a war movie, but it was as great in its own way. Um, Terminator 2, Jim, uh, Jim again, um, uh, matched himself and topped himself with that sequel. So it is possible to, to make a great sequel. But it's very rare uh, because usually the reasons for doing it are the dollars. Um, so we'll see. I, I can't speak to the um, stories for Jurassic World or Terminator Genesis. I haven't read either one. My fingers are crossed that they at least uphold uh, the quality of the originals. But I share your concerns about sequels in general. So we shall see. Well, uh, um, this is kind of a good segue because the original Terminator which I believe I've seen a, a behind-the-scenes photo or two with a, a young Matt Winston uh, hanging out on set. Uh, that was actually pretty much a budget movie. There was a lot of guerrilla filmmaking, a lot of chances taken, and that's really what generates the, the properties is that amount of risk. I feel that in this day and age, with the technology uh being so advanced and so available to everybody that it's actually outside the studios that these uh these new properties uh can be created these risks can be taken and i have to say uh your school the Stan Winston School of Character Arts that you've created seems to be having a big hand in that by not only saying this technology is available, but also being a place, a centralized place, where if you want to know how to create this movie magic, you can go and learn it and make your own film. Yes, it has. Stan Winston School has become exactly that, and that is what we wanted it to be from the very beginning. The school was born out of a few things. Uh, number one, obviously, just missing dad and missing being around his energy on a daily basis and, you know, trying to figure out a way we could um, get back invested in this world, be around these wonderful artists and have dad in our lives. So obviously that's part of where it came from. The other place it, it came from was looking at the landscape of films being made and seeing that um, thanks to producers with a very short... Uh, memory of a hundred years of Hollywood technique, seeing them lean on one tool. You know, CGI, CGI is wonderful, but it's one tool, and filmmaking should use every tool so that the audience doesn't know how the magic was created, and that just wasn't happening. And we were thinking of, of a way to reinvigorate practical effects, and obviously sharing it was one part of it and sharing the, the knowledge, but I think building a massive social media community has given us a megaphone to go beyond those who are just aspiring artists, but to a general audience and say, hey guys, look at what, look at what we've made for a hundred years. How cool is this? And wouldn't you like to see more of this? And I think it has proven to some degree to studios and, and, uh, other decision makers that there is a built-in audience that loves magic and wants to be fooled and doesn't want just one tool used. So 
Yeah, that's kind of what it's become, and it's very exciting that it's more than just a school. It's a gathering place for a community and a place to celebrate. I remember um, you had uh, a booth at Monster Palooza and did a live three-hour makeup demo with Steve Johnson. And Steve Johnson was very enamored with something that Alec Gillis said, and I've heard him in several interviews quote him on it, which is uh, Alec Gillis said, if you only have a hammer, every problem is going to look like a nail. And obviously you can't build a house purely on nails. You have to have all the other tools as well, or else you're going to have a pretty weak house. Absolutely. You need to mix up the techniques. And this is true of anything. I mean, as a, as a chef, as a builder of homes, I mean, whatever. You just, there's a reason all those tools were developed, because they work and they give you a result that is unique. And uh, honestly, to boil it all down, I miss the days of leaning forward in my chair when I watch a movie and saying, how did they do that? And when you take an all-digital approach, no one's asking that question. They know exactly how you did it. They don't know the ins and outs, but they know it was on a computer. Uh, whereas when you mix the techniques, you, you get that reaction from people again, and the filmmaking experience becomes more exciting. So um, gotta got to mix it up. Got to use, use all the techniques. I have to say, too, these days I think audiences have kind of been pre... I don't want to say pre-programmed because audiences are smart. They they do think for themselves, but there's kind of a conditioning that says when you go to a movie, uh, you should be expecting the most realistic effects uh, possible. And I feel that we've reached a, a point with effects where... It's not so much for me anymore about how real can it look, nor is it when I go to an art gallery, I don't look at an impressionist painting and then go over to a photograph and go, well, that photograph is better because it looks more real. I'm right. enjoying the textures of a impressionist painting, just how when uh, Jason and the Argonauts, when they fight the skeletons, that doesn't look real, but it still looks beautiful, and I still enjoy it for what it is. So I, I feel like another great thing about your school is it's educating people on the merits of individual techniques and individual artists. Absolutely. You, you hit something so important, which is what we're celebrating is, is craft. And uh, these crafts, stop motion animation is a great example. I just saw Box Trolls recently. And that, that film did blend traditional and digital, but it made you lean forward and appreciate the artistry, and you knew that an artisan had sculpted and painted and positioned that puppet, and you appreciated the hands behind it all, and it only added to the experience, because you knew you could feel the blood, sweat, and tears, and passion just oozing out of every every moment, and you know, we, we have a recent lesson with the Kyoto Brothers, and yeah, the puppet they built is impressionistic and broad and a bit cartoony, but it was made with human hands and manipulated with human hands, and that is a, an amazing craft. Wow. So that is really what we're doing, is celebrating crafts. We're not limiting ourselves to only those things that will give you the most, you know, exacting, photorealistic, uh, you know, results. Or it, that's not what it's about. It's really about, there's a lot of crafts out there, and they deserve to live on. You reminded me of another thing. Uh, the Fantastic Mr. Fox, they used real animal hair in the uh, figures that they animated uh, because they wanted to see, like the original King Kong, the fur move around each yeah. time the artist moved the uh, the armature because they wanted you to feel the artist. Touch, yes. which I thought was very, for me, that's very profound. And also, uh, moving along though to the Kyoto Brothers, that is actually a a new was a three part stop motion okay. animation course that you guys are going to be putting out. It's four parts. Uh, part one just released puppet creation. They walk you through creating a basic stop motion puppet with a uh, movable armature and all the other uh, requirements you need to add to your puppet to animate it. 
Then we move into set construction in the next installment, and then uh, lighting and storyboarding and all that other stuff, and then finally animation in the fourth installment. So this is something we have not yet done. We did one stop motion animation course a while back, but this is much more comprehensive and and uh, very exciting because again, just another way to create characters and tell stories, and that's what we're all about. I'm really glad that you mentioned in there the storyboards because one of the things that I've found, and I, I don't want to sound curmudgeonly or complaining, uh, I, as a filmmaker myself, sometimes I feel a frustration these days because equipment is so accessible to people, there's a tendency to just want to grab it and run and shoot without actually having a, a respect or appreciation for pre-planning what you're going to do so you get the best possible results. And uh, and I think that, again, one of the things that has excited me about your school is uh, seminars like, I believe, uh, I think Shannon Shea actually did a seminar as filmmaking or special effects as a business. The Business of Making Monsters with Shannon Shea. And then there was also another one where, I think this is a recent one, you guys actually have a uh, class on how to create a lookbook. Is that correct? Oh, well, that was one aspect of a course called uh, Production Design, Creating a World for Film. Uh -huh. That's taught by Eddie Yang and Jabbar Raisani, and they went through the entire production design process for their film Alien Outpost from creating the initial lookbook, which is the the sort of book that very quickly distills in images and text the the world of the film. And we moved all the way through the design process for uh, all the characters and vehicles and the sets to the um, uh, on-set production requirements and all the way into post VFX and marketing. But Yes, we're we're trying to um, move beyond just uh, crafts for building a specific character, but all the way into the storytelling process to give those characters a place to live. Um, it's very exciting that, that we're growing this way. I'm excited about it because I think that uh, professionalism, whether you're an indie filmmaker or working for the studios, is really paramount. It's going to teach uh, young fi uh, young filmmakers, excuse me, uh, the value of not only what they're doing, uh, but doing the best possible job and also respecting, uh, the budget you have, uh, respecting that producers, uh, you know, they, they have to fulfill the, uh, the final product and make sure that it makes money and it shows them a return. All of these things play into that. Another thing that I really appreciate is you guys aren't just throwing classes at these kids and then moving them along. Uh, I was very impressed to see a little video spotlight on a, a young concept artist and creature designer may, named uh, Michael Epinet. Michael Epinet. And uh, he got to design after being a student of yours. I am correct in that, right? He, yes, yes, yes. Uh, he got to design a creature for your Oculus Rift uh, film experience that you're creating called Kaiju Fury. Yes, yes. Michael was one of the lead designers on Kaiju Fury, which is our virtual reality homage to the old Godzilla films. We He actually was selected by our students. We had a contest. He and Mark Andrew Schneider who's a, a very talented mask maker, won the contest, and then we held a class, a two-week monster suit building class, led by Ted Haynes and Bill Bryan, and they built their suits. And then uh, Ian Hunter led a parallel team building a miniature city for them to fight in, and then we shot a movie. And, uh, and it was great because the students were at the front of everything. They designed it. They built it. They were on set performing in the suits, and they got to experience the whole process, and the film went to Sundance. I was there last month. It was in the New Frontier Division at Sundance Film Festival celebrating uh, breakthroughs in, in storytelling. So it was fantastic that it was the students who, 
who drove that, and, and uh, we certainly don't leave our students behind. I'm glad you noticed that. Oh, that, uh, that just must have been an amazing experience uh, for them. And I also, I know this is actually nothing new as you guys have grown as a school. There was another young woman uh, named Steph Koza who started her own little company called Placebo Effects, but I know she uh, was a student online for the Stan Winston School, and uh, you guys noticed her too. You put uh, her up in the forefront of your Facebook page. Uh, I think you featured one of her videos, and now she's off and running, uh, creating her own content and owning her own business, and I thought that was quite remarkable. Yeah, Steph is another one of our favorites. She uh, is a mistress of the macabre. She loves blood and gore, and she also loves the fantasy stuff. But we noticed her uh, very early on, and she was about 17, I think, when we saw her stuff. And we've promoted her periodically throughout the years. We've connected her with people in town, and um, we feel blessed to be able to do that. You know, unlike most schools... Um, who are not necessarily connected to working professionals, that's where we live. Every single one of our faculty are actually working in shops or running shops. So we're able to to make connections and, and make meaningful um, things happen for, for the artists that stand out. So there's been some other exciting things that you've been a part of. One of the things that kind of excites me uh, just in a uh, fanboy sense, is that you are also an actor. Uh, you were the uh, temporal agent Daniels on Star Trek Enterprise, which I very much enjoyed, and you were also in one of my very favorite Star Trek movies, Galaxy Quest. Yes. Uh, that my wife and I, we I think we put that movie on at least once a month, and we have been doing so... Uh, in the 13 years of our marriage. That's so, great. So we really love that movie. Uh, and now you're also uh, kind of contributing to other independent practical effects movies. You have roles in both of uh, Alec Gillis's movie Harbinger Down and uh, Tom Woodruff Jr.'s uh, Fire City Interpreter of Signs. Uh, are you... Are you still pursuing acting, or is it something that you just kind of fall into uh, as you uh, contribute to the cause, so to speak? Uh, it's really more the latter. I, When we founded Stan Winston School, I uh, was under the illusion that I would be able to juggle that and my acting career. I did act for about 15 years as my primary source of revenue in my life and then it came it became very apparent as the company grew that it was going to require all of my attention and then some um, in addition to my brother-in-law Eric Litoff and the whole team I mean it's it's a 24-7 operation and it requires ultimate focus and I found that I was just unable to act anymore and I was not really missing it so um, I, I really full-time work on Stan Winston School. This is my life. But if friends of mine who make monsters make make a movie and want me to come play for a little bit, I'll consider that. So that's that's what I've been doing. Occasionally, my monster friends will will convince me to act again. On a personal note, uh, as a filmmaker, I, I'm here in Texas trying to uh, be a producer and learn pretty much every aspect of filmmaking so I can communicate better with everyone that is part of the teams that I put together. But I know that uh, your classes, uh, especially my favorite, uh, the Rod Puppet classes and things like How to Build Tentacles, uh, have helped me quite a bit in creating the kind of monsters that I uh, like to see. Do you have any favorite classes that you watch over and over again, or you just think like, man, that really hit what it's all about for me? Hmm, that's a good one. You know, I can't play favorites. Uh, I, we love all of our faculty equally, 
And I'm not just being political, I mean it. I think there's something remarkable in each artist's story and craft they practice. Um, I, I like the big picture of it. Each, each thing speaks to me, and I, I don't sit and rewatch lessons over and over. My great joy is actually being on set and a part of the lessons uh, when we shoot them. Um, and I, I don't know. It's, I, I can't answer this question. I can't single out a specific lesson. I'm sorry. I love the big picture. I love the mosaic. I love stepping back and saying, wow, look at all of the brilliant people who are part of this venture and look at all the amazing things they're teaching. I, I can't single one out. Sorry. <laughs> That's quite all right. Well, um, I've just been very excited what you guys have coming up. Uh, you guys, I think it was something like an eight-hour live webcast throughout the day. Uh, I used IMAX. We were at the International Makeup Artist Trade Show, IMAX. But anyway, yeah, so some of your upcoming classes, there was uh, silic- silicone uh, appliance transfers. That's something that I don't know much about. Um, that was a class we did recently with Neil Gorton, who's out of the UK. Very, very talented makeup artist. You've seen his work on Wolfman, uh, Doctor Who, um, Saving Private Ryan, lots of stuff. So he taught that, silicone prosthetic transfers. We hadn't taught that yet, and he, he did a great job. And we have uh, Bruce Spalding Fuller, one of our favorite uh, faculty. We've been working with him frequently since we started. He's got a culminating class on a multi-piece prosthetic application incorporating both silicone and foam latex prosthetics. Uh, following that, we've got Amy Macabeo doing a, an advanced prosthetic hair laying course where she'll show you how to lay hair on, on a multi-piece prosthetic. Then we have uh, hand and rod puppet performance coming up with Bill Diamond. We have, oh, a very exciting one, animatronic control systems, basic Arduino programming coming up with David Covarubius from Stan Winston Studio and Legacy Effects. He's going to show you how to mechanize your props and costumes with Arduino technology. So tons of cool stuff coming up. And we're, we're actually scheduled all the way through next fall with classes. So so you guys aren't running out of anything to teach anytime soon, it sounds ever, like. Ever, ever. Uh, people, when we started this, people were like, how many, you know, how many sculpting classes can you do? How many makeup classes can you do? And I said to them, you have no idea. Number one, you can do a lot of sculpting classes because every sculptor has a different feel to how they work, different stories to tell, different techniques they've developed. But beyond that, there are so many crafts that go into creating characters from stop motion to makeup effects to visual effects to marionetting and old-fashioned puppetry to whatever the future holds. So we'll never run out of stuff to teach. That Um, You know, whatever the future holds is really the key there because what a lot of people have kind of taken for granted is that, uh, yes, we have a lot of advances in computer technology, CGI, but that doesn't mean that at any time uh, there have not been advances in practical effects as well. People are always coming up with new techniques uh, and, and blowing the old techniques out of the water. Absolutely, and maybe they haven't been seen on the big screen, but they've been seen on the stage. I went to see... Uh, the Walking with Dinosaurs show, I went to see the How to Train Your Dragon live show, and the animatronic techniques they're using and the materials they're using are incredible. And I think that that industry will even get better and better, and then those work their way back into films. But but yes, I mean, look, who who is going to argue that androids are not a definite part of our future? And we all know that's going to happen. It's already happening. You guys brought a, a robot to the San Diego Comic Con, didn't you? Absolutely. I mean, that was a it, yes, it was a man in a suit. But yeah, that was a live. We've done that two years in a row. I, of course, why am I promoting Walking with Dinosaurs when I can promote Giant Robot? <laughs> that's right. We uh, in partnership with Legacy Effects, my dad's former team. Uh, and Wired Magazine, we put together two fantastic live characters that we took to Comic-Con. 
no pixels required, and we blew people's minds right in front of their eyes. And so, yes, practical effects continues to develop, uh, digital effects continue to develop, and most excitingly, the bridge between them continues to develop, because I think that is really the ultimate solution, is to use it all, you know, build that practical thing, enhance it digitally where you need to, and then an audience goes, how the hell did they do that? Because I know it's not all digital, I know it's not all practical, it's just blowing my mind, you know, so, um, yeah, whatever the future holds is the key, and we're all about innovation, just like my father. My father never was about repeating himself, it was always about what do we do different next time, how do we top ourselves? Yeah, and the uh, I think the fact that you caused such a commotion and and uh, and videos went viral over the robot, and then the creatures you created the following year that were on Jimmy Kimmel Live, um, you know, show that people still want to believe that that can actually be in front of them, uh, and and they can interact with it. And that's, uh, I think that's what those live appearances, also things like cosplay really show that, that, you know, people want to have an interaction with it that, uh, or at least believe they can have an interaction with it. And they understand that CGI is, is not really there. Exactly. You know, we as human beings have more than two senses, sight and sound. We have more than that. We have, uh, touch and taste and smell and, a movie screen can only satisfy you so far, whereas being in the same physical space with something um, just amps you up in a different way, you know? I mean, one of the greatest experiences I've ever had in my life, and I knew, I knew it was fake, I saw it being built, was being on stage with the T-Rex for the, during the filming of Jurassic Park, being there on the fully dressed stage, when it was complete, the animatronics were done, it was in position, it was ready to perform, and I got to stand there right in front of it between takes, and it was alive and moving, and I, my heart jumped, you know, I mean, my stomach turned, it was thrilling, and it's because I was in the same room with it, and I think we as human beings will always seek that kind of excitement, so, you know, Building real things will never go away because we won't allow it to go away. It's still too much fun for us. So I'm going to wrap this up with a a quote from Stan Lee when people... He was asked, uh, what do you think about comics on the computer screen? And I'll, I'll try and do my best Stan Lee impersonation here. He said, comics are kind of like boobs. Sure, they look great on your computer screen, but isn't it really nicer to hold one in your hand? <laughs> this is why Stan Lee is so healthy at his age. <laughs> he's, he's still a horn dog. <laughs> he's a he's a genius, and I think that you know, as funny as he's being there, that's a very valid point. So, um, okay, I'm gonna a- absolutely. Isn't it always better to hold it in your hand? Generally speaking in life, isn't it always better than whatever we're talking about, right? I think that, <laughs> you know, yeah, and uh, and maybe that is one, for all the great things that the Internet and technology has given us, uh, you know, that might be the one thing that is harder to hold on to is kind of that, that sense of self, that individual experience, uh, understanding that you don't always have to go in as a group and just see it on the screen. There's a joy in and getting your hands dirty and creating something or being able to reach out and touch something that somebody else has created, uh, you know, that that visceral life experience that everyone should have, you know, get out, get out of the house, get out of the, you know, the shop. Uh, like Indiana Jones said, you're never, you, you can't be an archaeologist if you're not going to get out of the library every once in a while. I- Absolutely agreed, and what's ironic is that we are a digital school entirely, and yet we celebrate the real world and encourage people to get their hands dirty, like you say. Isn't that crazy? Well, you it's the way to reach people. I think you have yeah. to reach people the way you can. If there was another way to do it, you'd be doing it that way. I think the message in this case is not... The the old saying, the medium is the message. In this case, the medium truly isn't the Internet. 
that's just the means of getting it to you. The message is in the lessons that you guys are teaching and the, the art forms that you guys are promoting. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up and say thank you. Um, Matt Winston, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, I hope that we can get you to join us another time. We're going to do many more of these shows and, and uh, hopefully bring back guests and, and talk these points some more. So uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Christopher, and you can count me in on any future discussion on this podcast because what you're doing is very important. We need to celebrate practical effects and you know make sure that real monsters never die, right? Absolutely. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Matt Winston, and this is Christopher Moonlight. Again, you can find me at ChristopherMoonlight.blogspot.com or Google me. Find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Also, look out for my movie in progress, The Quantum Terror. I'm very excited about that. Uh, and we will be back uh, next time. We, well... We're still lining up more artists, but we guarantee we're going to bring you more great conversations. Have a good evening, morning, or whenever you're listening. Thank you very much.